I built my very own CNC plasma cutter. Before you can have a CNC plasma cutter, you first need a plasma cutter. After much research, I settled on the Yes Welder Cut 55 DS Pro. This is a 55 amp, non-high frequency, non-touch pilot arc plasma cutter. This is the original version of this plasma cutter as the newest version has a digital screen and a few additional features, but it's basically the exact same plasma cutter. The link will be in the description. It's not the cheapest one on the market, but I spent the extra money for one key feature, the non-high frequency blowback arc start. Hundreds of videos, forum posts, and Facebook group discussions detail people on similar DIY CNC plasma cutter journeys having considerable issues using super cheap or super old plasma cutters that use high frequency start. The high frequency causes significant interference with the control electronics and signal wires. Unless you spend a significant amount of time and money using shielded wires, properly grounding the machine, isolating the electronics from the interface, etc. In fact, the Fulgitech Fortis CNC that this frame started life as was once R&D'd to have a plasma cutting capability, but the cheap plasma cutter used for testing would constantly cause the machine to reset and freak out. My research showed that a non-high frequency plasma cutter should eliminate these issues. And since I knew I would eventually create a CNC plasma cutter anyway, I jumped straight for it. Before its transformation into a plasma cutter, this machine was once a CNC router. A Fulgitech Fortis HD to be exact. Back when I worked at Fulgitech, I received this CNC router so I could experiment and assist customers, but I never really used it outside of that. For years it sat on a table in the garage, never really being used. Then suddenly in early 2024, the weather in Florida cooled down just enough to make the garage bearable, and I set out on a journey to convert this router to plasma. At the end of the day, the conversion is really not that difficult. You're essentially removing the router spindle and replacing it with a plasma torch. Easy, right? Well, actually, yeah. The first iteration of this machine was just that. I removed the spindle, mounted a small metal plate, and attached a metal P-clamp sized for the torch nozzle, and just bolted it all down. There was no material detection, no safety breakaway, the material had to be raised on some wood boards, and the frame was much too narrow for a standard sheet of material. But it worked. Yes, I know the lead screws are not the best system for plasma cutters. Sometimes you need the machine to move fast and lead screws just don't really work well for that. But this works for what I need. The first iteration of this also didn't have torch control. I simply connected the torch control from the machine to a handheld switch. I had to manually set the torch height before every cut. There was no piercing time or decent speed controls as I was not using a plasma cutting software yet. But the proof of concept was working. I knew at this point that I wanted two major upgrades on the machine. The cutting area should be larger and the machine should have automatic material detection. Widening the frame was the first thing to tackle, and let me say, it was a pain in the butt. All right, this is the beginning of a project. <laughs> With the Fulgitech Fortis CNC, I've already converted it to a plasma cutter, but I wanna make it bigger, and so my thought is to, instead of have these um, linear rails and bearings on the outside, and then you're losing that much travel on this you know it comes out to here so let's put it on this side and then you'll have the full width of this 24 inches plus you know what, what sticks out over here so this would actually come into here so um, i'll be able to fit like at least a two by four sheet on here um, which would be pretty cool the act itself wouldn't have been so difficult if i wasn't limited by me not wanting to spend any additional money on this project so any adjustments I made had to use the existing parts or components that I had on hand. Keeping the same overall design while widening the X components with longer rails and aluminum extrusions would have been a great idea. But I didn't have any 2020 laying around that was long enough to do this and I didn't want to spend any money on longer bearing rails. This led to me basically inverting the overall design, giving me close to 5 additional inches of width. I also needed to change where the base plane would sit so that I could eventually put sacrificial slats to rest the material on. This required various custom brackets, weird offcuts of extrusions, and a few pieces of Unistrut as the base plane. Seriously, Unistrut is super cheap per foot, especially compared to regular extrusions or steel stocks. This whole setup works pretty well, but of course after a few uses I grew tired of needing to manually set the material height before every cut. Even basic CNC plasma cutters have at least some sort of material detection. So I set out to design the easiest to implement, 
the floating head torch mount. There are a million ways to make a floating head, and admittedly, mine is not perfect. It doesn't even really look that great. It works, but it's not very elegant as some of them out there. I will likely come back to this down the road, but for now, this design, it, it works. The torch is secured with a 3D printed block that I created, which rides two short chrome rods. Only the force of gravity is keeping the head at its lowest point. Positioned just behind the torch block is a small micro switch, one that I had laying around in my pile of 3D printing parts. I designed and plasma cut a bracket to attach everything to, and assembled. The floating head bracket is magnetically attached to the main Z bracket, only because that was the easiest design to throw together really quick. It works well for what it is. The micro switch is positioned a few millimeters above the torch block, such that when the material detection process is run, the torch nozzle touches the material and stops moving. The Z axis continues to move down until the switch is activated. Through a decent amount of trial and error, the offset between the nozzle touching the material and the switch being activated is already known, and now the machine is at material height, minus a small offset. After adjusting its coordinates, it moves up to an exactly pre-programmed height above the material. Now it can start a cut. This process runs before every cut during a program. At the heart of this project is the DDCS 2.1 CNC controller. Designed for CNC routers, none of this project works without the control board being wired correctly. The biggest issue is that, since this controller is not a plasma controller, there's very little documentation online for using it for this purpose. The wiring, material detection functions, and G-code format were all things that I basically had to figure out on my own. Since, at the end of the day, the original router was just a CNC machine, the overall function of the machine hasn't really changed from its original configuration to now. I was able to remove the spindle power supply and a few accessory components and just leave the X, Y, and Z stepper drivers. The machine can now move as it did before. The first major hurdle was needing to switch the plasma arc on and off as the button on the torch does. Luckily, the plasma cutter uses a standard 16mm GX16 aviation connector for its switch input. Making my own cable to run from the plasma cutter to the CNC controller is simple enough. But how do I use the controller like a switch? For those of you unfamiliar, most of the ports on a CNC controller like this either tell the controller something's happening, such as an end stop being triggered, or sending out commands, such as a stepper motor direction and step pulses. The plasma cutter, on the other hand, is expecting a switched connection, basically just hot wiring its two pins together. Luckily for us, a simple component, a relay, can be used as an intermediary between the controller and the plasma cutter. As it happens, when I send the G-code command M3, the controller's M3 pin drops to ground. And when the command S12000 is sent, the VSO pin sends a voltage of about 10 volts, indicating full spindle speed, creating a small power supply of sorts. This is normally used with a spindle speed controller. In my case, I'm connecting the input side of this solid state relay to the M3 and VSO pins, essentially turning on the solid state relay when I tell the board to enable the spindle. The switching side of the solid state relay is, well, a switch, just like the switch on the handle of the plasma torch. The two wires that I connected to the plasma torch earlier terminate at the switch side of the solid state relay. And when I tell the controller to turn on the spindle, the plasma cutter arc is enabled. The final part of wiring this controller was enabling the material detection. The DDCS has a built-in probe function which will work perfectly for this application. The two wires coming out of the micro switch on the floating head come into the machine and terminate at the probe and ground pins on the DDCS. I had to make a few adjustments in the firmware to get it working, but that's really all that there is. Also, on a side note, the firmware that was on this DDCS controller was the original older firmware, and it didn't support the probe function very well. In fact, it didn't really work at all in my testing. Updating the firmware to the newest version, which I found online somewhere, I'll link it below, solved this problem. At this point, I have a working CNC plasma cutter. All that needs to be done now is make some sort of G-code for it to run. I found a free program online called MyPlasm CNC, which is a very basic but still powerful G-code generating software specifically designed for CNC plasma cutters. It's actually designed to be used with their proprietary controller, but it has a neat little feature that makes all of this possible. I'm not gonna really walk you through how the software works. There's other videos online for that, at least not in this video, but I will show you how the magic happens. Once I have imported a DXF file and I have all my speeds and times correct, 
I can hit the shortcut Control E on the keyboard to enable a secret button. This allows you to export the G-code for your project. This isn't a very documented feature, but it is incredibly useful in that now we have a G-code file that is tailored for plasma cutters. That should be all we need to run something, right? Well, remember how the DDCS controller is a CNC router controller, not a CNC plasma cutter controller. The G-code exported from the MyPlasm software would run really well on the MyPlasm controller, but we have to try a little harder to make it work with my controller. We need a post processor. A post processor is basically a translator for converting CAM to G-code. It figures out what moves need to be made by the machine to create the part that we're trying to create, and it creates G-code in the format that your machine is expecting. The MyPlasm software has already done the bulk of the work for us. All the travel moves, X, Y, and Z, all work totally fine. But when it comes to the material detection, their controller uses a different set of G-code commands that my controller is just not compatible with. To combat this, I created my own post processor using Python. After exporting my raw G-code, this program searches the file for the commands that run the material detection process. It removes them, then inserts my own code that my DDCS controller can work with. In this case, it searches for the G31 command, which is what MyPlasm uses for material detection. It then replaces the G31 with a sequence of M101, M102, and M103 commands, which are the probe signal monitoring commands on the DDCS. When you run the material detection command, the controller tells the Z to go to an arbitrary position much lower than the material, and while it's traversing, it's sending out a signal to the probe pins, which are wired to the micro switch in the floating head. When the Z axis lowers enough to trigger the micro switch, the controller stops all movement. It then switches the probe back on and starts moving upwards until the micro switch is turned off. This helps remove any possible backlash in the micro switch. Once the micro switch is off, the DDCS controller knows the nozzle is resting on the material and it's a specified distance below the surface, which is exactly the distance between the bottom resting position of the floating head and the trigger point of the micro switch. This offset distance is constant and known. It then zeroes itself out, adds in the offset, and then moves up to a certain location. After the controller has found the material height, it needs to turn on the torch. With this controller, Sending the M3 command only drops the M3 pin to ground, but it's not enough to turn on the VSO pin to activate the solid state relay to enable the torch. So my post processor also fixes this by finding any M3 command and adding S12000 to the line. This ensures the controller believes the spindle needs to be set to 12,000 RPM. 12,000 RPM is what I have set as maximum spindle speed in the DDCS settings which ensures the VSO pins get the voltage needed to activate the solid state relay. I did find that in my testing that just adding S12000 to one of the many M3 commands is enough to make it work throughout the entire job, and I'm not really sure why. But since these changes are being done programmatically, adding it to every instance is not that hard. And that's that. I throw the process G code onto a flash drive, connect it to the machine, set the material in place, navigate and set my own origin on the workpiece, ensure my plasma cutter and its air supply is on, and then hit the go button on the controller. MyPlasm is an easy software to use that allows me to save material settings and adjust cutting parameters without being bloated and full of features that I'll never use. My custom post processor is written in Python, which allows me to make whatever changes I want whenever I need. The entire machine being built and wired by me means that I know all of the ins and outs of its design. That makes troubleshooting fairly easy. There's no better feeling than DIYing a machine that so many people pay thousands of dollars for, while also having a much deeper understanding for how and why everything works as it does. There are many issues with this design, and if I was designing this machine from scratch, it would look very different. Its design and functionality comes from necessity and not intent. I put very, very little money into this project and I did everything I could to reuse the components that this machine came with. I'm not using shielded wires or intricate grounding for the machine. I'm not using industrial components and there's no way this machine would last in a commercial environment, but that's not the point. I wanted to tackle this project from the amateur DIY guy point of view that I have and make it work for the sake of making it work. And I think the results speak for themselves. I can now use this machine to make custom parts and brackets for other projects. And more importantly, 
use it to cut custom shapes that I can use with my laser engraver. This is a game changer for my small workshop and my capabilities as a maker. And while you should never attempt anything that's outside of your bounds of knowledge and capabilities, especially when something can kill you or burn down your house if you do it wrong, building a DIY machine like this is definitely something I recommend you at least look into one day. Well, that's it. This is my CNC plasma cutter that I homemade using an old CNC router that was designed for wood, a controller that's not made for CNC plasma, and not spending any additional money on parts and pieces to make it work. But somehow, one way or another, I was able to make it work. I think the most interesting thing out of this whole thing is using the DDCS controller for plasma purposes, which it's not really designed for. But I know there's a couple people out there, a couple, just a few videos out there of people who have pulled it off but there's not much information and hopefully there's a little bit of information in this video if you're trying to do it yourself. If you found this video entertaining or you found it helpful, give it a like. That's why I uh, plasma cut out the little like button. Hit the like button. Subscribe if you're interested in videos like this because I might be going more in depth on certain aspects of this uh, in the future. But that's basically all I got. Remember, making is one of the coolest things that anyone can do. So don't let anyone ever tell you that you can't do something and don't ever think that because you've never done something before, you'll never be able to do it because you just got to try. Anyway, hope you all enjoyed and I'll see y'all later.